This is a hard LSAT sample reading comprehension question. And for the GRE and GMAT, this would be a long reading comprehension passage. I haven't seen the question before, but I'm gonna demonstrate some of the techniques that I advise, including reading slowly, critically engaging, not taking physical notes, and I'm also gonna analyze and discuss some of the answers, what to look out for in terms of wrong answers and correct answers. Let's get started. The painter Lichtenstein helped to define pop art, the movement that incorporated commonplace objects and commercial art techniques into paintings. Interesting. By paraphrasing the style of comic books in his works, so he kind of used comic books. The merger of a popular genre with the forms and intentions of fine art, mixing comic books with fine art, interesting, generated a complex result. While poking fun, at the pretensions of the art world, it's kind of mocking, his work also managed to convey a seriousness of theme that enabled it to transcend mere parody. So it wasn't just mocking, it was more. Notice how difficult the words are for some of them. That his images were fine art was at first difficult to see because with their word balloons and highly stylized figures, they looked like nothing more than comic book panels from which they were copied, interesting. Standard art history holds that pop art emerged as an impersonal alternative to the histrionics of abstract expressionism. That's really difficult. But they're just talking about how pop art, popular art, emerged as an alternative to this abstract kind of form of art. And this expressionism was a movement in which painters conveyed their private attitudes and emotions using non-representational techniques. I know this is difficult, but stick with it. Try to understand as much as you can by reading slowly. The truth is that by the time pop art first appeared in the early 1960s, abstract expressionism had already lost much of its force. It was already dying out. Pop art painters weren't quarreling, arguing with the powerful early abstract expressionist work of the late 1940s, but with a second generation of expressionists whose work seemed airy, high-minded and overly lyrical. So that's what pop art was quarreling with or arguing with, this second generation whose work was airy, highfalutin, intellectualized, high-minded, lyrical. Pop art paintings were full of simple black lines and large areas of primary color, primary like red, blue, etc. His work was part of a general rebellion against the fading emotional power of the other guys rather than an aloof, arrogant attempt to ignore it. They weren't ignoring it, they were rebelling against it. But if rebellion against previous art by means of a careful imitation of a popular genre were all that characterized his work, it would only possess, it would possess only, sorry, the reflective power that parodies have in relation to their subjects. It would just be a reflection, a parody, a mockery. Beneath the surface, beneath its cartoonish methods, his work displays an impulse towards realism, interesting, an urge to say that what was missing from modern contemporary painting was the depiction of contemporary life. There it is, that's why they're rebelling. You're not depicting contemporary life. The stilted romances, the fake romances, and war stories portrayed in the comic books on which he based his canvases the stylized automobiles, cars, hot dogs, and table lamps that appeared in his pictures were reflections of the culture that he inhabited, real life, day-to-day -day situations. But in contrast to some pop art, his work exuded, gave off, not a cynicism. Jaded here means bored, lacking enthusiasm. Cynicism is like skepticism. They gave off not a jaded cynicism about consumer culture, a kind of deliberate naivete. Naivete is like innocence, intended as a response to the excess of sophistication he observed not only in the later and some. So he also saw this in some other people, other pop artists. With the comics, typically the domain of youth and innocence, as his reference point, a nostalgia, a longing for the past, fills his paintings that gives them, for all their surface bravado, a show of courage, an inner sweetness. 
His persistent use of comic art conventions demonstrates a faith in reconciliation. So the author is really praising this person. Faith in reconciliation, bringing two things together. Not only between cartoons and fine art, bringing those two together, but between parody, mocking, and true feeling. Very interesting piece, praising this guy Lichtenstein and his ability to do multiple things with pop art. Okay, let's analyse this one in some depth. Which one of the following best captures the author's attitude toward Lichtenstein's work? Enthusiasm for its more rebellious aspects. I like the first word enthusiasm, but I don't know if it's just about being rebellious though. Respect for its successful parody. It does parody those two things, but the author's more keen on the multiple things it does. Pleasure in the blatant rejection. Problem with that is it's a very negative answer, like rejecting these things. The author's more positive than that. Here we go. Uh, actually, E, appreciation for its ability to incorporate both realism and naivete. What I like about that is that, remember, the author was praising multiple aspects of this guy. I think all the other answers are a bit too one-dimensional. So A focuses on its rebellious aspects, but remember the author also talked about the true feeling. B talked about the parody, but then it's not just about mockery, it was about more than that, wasn't it? C talked about rejecting the other guys, and yes, it was a rejection of the other guys, but it's also something special in its own right. That's why I don't like those. D, a critique of contemporary culture. That was in one part of one paragraph, how it critiqued contemporary culture, but it also absorbed contemporary culture, didn't it? With the hot dogs and all the rest of it. So only E is a broad enough answer to satisfy me. It's an appreciation, and that word is nicer, isn't it? It's a softer word, which fits the tone of the writing. It's an appreciation for his ability to incorporate, bring together realism and naivety, to do both things at once, to be real, to bring in modern contemporary culture, but also to have true feeling about cartoons. Now, I would agree with anyone who found this hard. It is a difficult, difficult answer because all of the answer choices are tempting. And LSAT questions do tend to be harder in general in reading comprehension than GRE or GMAT. But this video is aimed at anyone doing any of those three tests. So you can still learn something even if you're doing GRE or GMAT. Let me check actually this answer and then we're gonna move on. Okay, the correct answer is E, yes, good. <laughs> Response E, most accurately and completely captures, that's what I thought. It's indicated by way of contrast. Okay, I'm not gonna read all of this, but that A was too focused on rebellion, B because it was more than just parody, I remember that. But to be honest, I didn't remember the individual lines and quotes that they're using. I just remembered the tone. And by reading slowly, I was able to pick up on that tone of the multifaceted aspect of this guy and why the author liked him. And that's how I got it right. Not by remembering these quotes, to be honest. Let's do the next question. The author most likely lists some of the themes and objects influencing and appearing in his paintings. I remember the hot dog and all the rest of it. Primarily to... I'd have to remind myself, when they quote a specific area, that's when I have to go back and look at it. I know what I'm looking for. Where was it? Here, middle of last paragraph. The romances, the stylized automobiles, they were reflections of the culture he inhabited. And then I always read a bit before and a bit after. Beneath the cartoonish stuff, he had realism and urge to say what was missing from contemporary painting was a depiction of the contemporary life. So that's what I predict the answer will be. He's using these real objects to say, this is what's missing from contemporary painting. To support the claim, no. C looks good. Contrast his approach. Yeah, contrast, because the other guys don't have this. They don't have these real objects. It's missing in contemporary art. I wouldn't say it's an endorsement of the attitude. We don't know what the author's opinions are about consumer culture. The only problem with C though, which is why I'm not really liking it as much, is that it never mentioned abstract expressionism, did it? 
it mentioned, what was it, contemporary art. It said, where was it? I've lost it again. Here we go. What was missing from contemporary painting? So I think that's a trap. At the LSAT level, they're going to go into this level of nuance. And I think it's a trap because we don't know if it's missing from expressionism, just from contemporary painting. But it's the best answer so far. But what does it say after? I didn't read after. They were reflections of the culture he inhabited. Okay, none of these are leaping out to me. Support the claim that his work definitely not be. Suggest the emotions. There's no emotions in that, in those few sentences. Definitely not E. Show that the paintings depict aspects of contemporary life. Hmm. Well, that's directly quoted right in the passage. I'm going to check one last time. Obviously, you wouldn't have time for this in the GRE and GMAT, but you would in the LSAT. And it was, they were reflections of the culture he inhabited. Reflections show that the paintings depict aspects of contemporary life. I think A is the best answer. It could be C, but I think C is a trap answer. The question takes the test. The correct response is A. Wow, I was really close to picking C. Yeah, they've quoted that bit. I had to look back. Honestly, I had to look back multiple times at the passage. I wouldn't have got that just through memory. Where was C? Yes. Um... This comparison does not involve the themes and objects mentioned in question two. Okay, so they didn't like C for a different reason. This is tough stuff. Okay, let's do three and then we can analyze again at the end. Primary purpose. So we're looking for a broad answer that kind of encompasses the whole passage, not a narrow section. Express curiosity. It's more than curiosity though. It's not interest, it's admiration for, isn't it? Clarify the motivation. Maybe. Contrast two opposing theories. There aren't really two theories, though. Describe the evolution. It's not like the artist evolved. We're just describing Lichtenstein throughout, not saying how he changed with different dates. Refute a previous overestimate. No, this can't be right. Refute means disprove. And an overestimation is where you think something's better than it is. And that would be implying that the author doesn't like the work, thinking that other people are overestimating it and the author needs to refute. So express curiosity? No, it's more than that. I think B is looking good. Clarify the motivation behind an artist's work. Just simply because it's the broadest. And remember the whole theme throughout was this guy is not just rejecting the other people, he has the motivation to depict contemporary life, show what's missing, show his true feelings. So basically, B is the only one that passes the test. Everything else is either really bad, like E, or A, too weak. It's more than just curiosity. The author actually has enthusiasm for the work. And I think in every single paragraph, let me just check the answer, and then if it's right, I'm going to talk about why. Yes, B is correct. And they say, because it most accurately and completely reflects the purpose of the passage as a whole. And just to quickly prove it, like clarify the motivation. It's throughout, in every single paragraph, you can see how it's about why is he doing it. He's doing it to poke fun. He's doing it to convey a seriousness. And then here it's, it's a rebellion. All these different reasons why he created this art. And it's in every paragraph. Some of the other answers, and remember for primary purpose, you're looking for something throughout the passage. Maybe was good, say C, contrast two opposing theories. Maybe in one of the paragraphs, you could point out two different theories, but that wouldn't be something throughout the passage. So that was a slightly easier question. But overall, you can tell that the LSAT reading comp really rewards close reading of the passage. This is not something you can quickly read. Now the GRE and GMAT, even though the passages would be easier, reward the same thing. You still wanna be reading slowly, even if the questions are a bit easier, because then you don't have to look back as often and the number you get correct will be much higher. 
I hope this was helpful to anyone studying for the LSAT, but also for those studying for the GRE and GMAT.